Okay, thanks so much, Peg. Um, well, I'm going to uh, jump in and uh, just briefly introduce Stephen. Uh, it's an absolute delight that um, for me to be able to welcome Stephen to Mountain Cloud like this. Um, he's a very interesting guy, actually. He he started practicing, I think, when very young, I mean, well, mid-teens or something like that. And his first uh, exploration in meditation was in Zen. Uh, uh, maybe Stephen, you'll correct me if I get any of this wrong, but but basically he's had a quite deep practice in a number of traditions, primarily in Zen and in Theravada, but I think also in some Tibetan Buddhism and perhaps in some non-dual Advaita uh, practices as well. Um, and um, especially on the Theravada side, that's early Buddhism, by the way, he, he, he has a, a very... Uh, deep training in Burma in jhana practice. Now, some of you will know about jhana, J-H-A-N-A -A is the Pali way it's written. And um, it's a particular interest to us Zenis because Zen comes from the word jhana. You know, jhana became chana and then chan in China and then chan became Zen in Japan. And we've received the Zen transmission from Japan in our lineage. Um, but apparently somehow it goes back to Jhana practice. And um, I, I will just let you know that um, in my curiosity about this, I actually have been privileged to have undergone training in Jhana practice with Stephen, who's uh, one of the, I think the few uh, in the West who have been authorized to teach particular style of jhana from burma and um so i think it's a it's been a very fascinating journey i must say um and um so he's really uh, got a lot <laughs> a lot of practice experience and a lot of wisdom that he's uh, absorbed and integrated and become really along the way so stephen thank you very much indeed for being with us tonight. A hearty, warm welcome to you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, everyone. It's really nice to be here with you all. And as Henry said, I am going to present and talk about the jhana practice and a little bit of the history and development of it. And the first thing I'll say <clears throat> is that coming up with the definition of jhana isn't too easy. Uh, but what I've come up with is that it's a no self merger with a specific unconditioned state. So a complete merger with an unconditioned state. So very powerful to experience. And this area of Theravada Buddhism is called the purification of mind sort of territory or teachings. So it's intended to purify the mind before one moves on to the Vipassana practice, which is a purification of view. So jhana practice predated the Buddha. It's believed that it was practiced for at least a thousand years before the Buddha was born. And it was first recorded in writing meaning in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. In reading the Yoga Sutras, I can see a lot of the components of what is practiced today, but it's not as systematized or set out the way that it can be today. And the, the Buddha practiced jhana, it's in his life story, it's reported that he practiced it first as a very young child. He practiced it at the end of his six years as an ascetic. And then he went on every rains retreat, every year, the, the Theravada monks during what they call wasa, which is the, the, the monsoon season in Southeast Asia, they all go to monasteries, a lot of them will live in forests during the other part of the year, but they go to the monasteries because it's torrential rain. And they, a lot of them practice jhana during that three months, the Buddha did. And then finally, the Buddha practiced jhana right before he died. That was his last practice. So it's quite impactful that that was such an important practice to the Buddha. I've been told by scholars that between 60 and 80% of the suttas, the sermons of the Buddha, contain reference to jhana as either right concentration or right samadhi of the eightfold path 
So uh, again, this is a purification of mind practice. So in the jhana lineage I'm in, which is considered by everybody to be to have the highest bar, meaning we really insist on a, a very deep uh, penetrating experience of jhana before we will certify it. There needs to be no sense of self. There needs to be no thoughts. And there's full pure awareness. And by pure awareness, I mean awareness without concept. So there's no referencing, this is like this experience. There's just the direct awareness of the jhana. And there's full awareness on the human side, but there's no sense of an I or a me. There's just awareness and the merging into the unconditioned state. The concentration meditation is presented and maintained in Theravadan Buddhism because it teaches us to open and direct the unity of awareness to one meditative object. We prioritize that med meditative object over everything else in our awareness or perception. So we're choosing to maintain that as the, the uh, focus of our attention. And I, I stumbled into the Theravadan tradition after more than 20 years in the Zen tradition, because I just, I guess I had this sort of koan about what did the Buddha practice? Practice. I was told often what the Buddha did about his awakening, some of his teaching around that and the transmission of the teachings to present day, but I really didn't know what he practiced. And that led me to the jhana practice and to my teacher, whose name is Paul Saidao. And Saidao is a, a term they give to monastics in Myanmar who have been monks for 30 years or more. So it's a very, he's been a monk since he was 10. I think he's pushing 90 right now, so a long time. So the big picture of, of jhana practice, it's a very, very much a present moment practice. We're being right here. We're not wanting to have our awareness move into the past, which usually means that we're mulling over remorse and regret or into the future where we spend time planning and hoping. Because when we're in either of those uh, time periods, we're really inviting a lot of craving. And so we really are, are not advancing our meditation. So we've got to really be here in the present moment. This is where everything is happening all the time. And in concentration meditation, as I mentioned, we focus on one object to the uh, prioritizing that over everything else. And what happens with this practice, I've given you the basic instruction, it's very simple, but it's complicated to do because our minds are working, our attention is wandering, but we've got to come back every time. We come back to the breath, we come back to the breath. And that begins like going to the gym, begins to build the muscle of concentration. And people will get to where they can be with the breath on retreat, both on the on the meditation cushion, but also off the cushion. This is a uh, as much as possible a twenty four seven meditation practice. And there are two areas of benefit that I see with this practice. One is I, I call transformational, and the transformational is that by focusing on our the awareness on our breath, we're pulling awareness from our usual sense of self, from our usual internal self talk. And much of our self-talk is a reifying or reasserting of identity. So you'll notice your narration in life, if you have this going on, you'll be wandering and you'll, you'll say, I like those shoes, I don't like that car, I like that tree, I don't like that house. And it's this constant judging we're doing. And what that's doing is it's reifying who we are based upon our likes and dislikes. And so going to the breath pulls us away from that pattern. So it, it, it means there's less allegiance to our customary self identity. We're also relaxing because we're, we're pulling our awareness away from the many activities of mind. And we're really letting ourselves relax deeply. This is also called a serenity or tranquility meditation. So this is used by monastics also in times of stress. They'll turn to this meditation because it will focus and will relax. The other area that this meditation develops is what I call the transcendent, because we're orienting to 
the source of no source to what's called the absolute in Buddhism sometimes, and really the absence quality, the emptiness quality of the absolute. So we're inviting greater inner spaciousness and we need inner spaciousness. It's like our canvas where our spiritual practice is painted. So we've got to, got, got to really pull away from the usual mind activities, let our mind really open, be in touch with the vast expanse of space that's here. The most common question or statement that I get with this practice is people say they can't feel the breath. And I'll report that I've had 100% success. Well, I haven't had it, but students have had it with everybody being able to find their breath and be with it. Even people who have had some surgery or some issues with their nose can breathe through their mouth. They sort of let their breath curl up into this area. So I've seen 100% success in getting contact with their breath. So again, concentration, as it's used in Buddhism, means a unifying of the mind. So you're collecting the mind, gathering the mind. And it's viewed that there's three levels of concentration potential in concentration meditation. Every meditation has the first two, which are momentary concentration and access concentration. Momentary concentration is simply being with your meditative object in this moment. So in this breath, you're with you're in this moment, you're with the breath. That's the momentary concentration. It's returning again and again. Access concentration begins when we're with the object for five to 15 minutes without serious interruption. And access concentration is a wide range of experience. It goes all the way up to the door of jhana, to the right to the edge of jhana. So we can really be very, very deep. We can have thoughts can, will have stopped in high access concentration. We'll be very present, very aware, but we start functioning from the kind of energetic impulse that's pre-thought. All of us have this energetic impulse. We're just so attuned to having the thought be the first experience or the first uh, notice of something happening. Like there's an energetic impulse, uh, well, I need water. But before that gets formed into a thought, you know, I, I can act on it. I just, there's a knowing and intuition that comes with it. And so um, access concentration is called neighborhood concentration because it can be very near to jhana. And other presentations of jhana really have a more relaxed standard in here. So things, people that are in high access concentration will sometimes get confirmed as jhana even though there's thought or there's a sense of me happening. And as I mentioned in the tradition I'm in, we're, we're known for being you know, quite strict about that. We wanna really have people have a deep penetration, a deep experience. And finally, the third stage, which is only available in concentration meditation is called jhana or absorption. And this really becomes like a laser. It's talked about as laser-like awareness. So our awareness dials down into this magnificent laser that we can direct in different places to different things and really have a penetrative experience. One of my students is a, a neurophysicist and he's been telling me about lasers and how lasers of course can cut metal and things, but also they can move objects. They've gotten them to move things. So, you know, imagine the power that's just a beam of light is able to penetrate metal and move objects a distance. So this is, the, this is the property of our mind if we practice this. Purification of mind is available in all levels of concentration, but in jhana, it's the most direct. Jhana, being in jhana, one of the qualities is it's like there's a radio frequency, a kind of an energetic field that we enter into in jhana. So you feel like you're sitting in this this energetic field that has a kind of a frequency or hum almost. And as we complete the jhana and for one to complete it normally requires specified amounts of time in jhana. My teacher required me to spend three hours uninterrupted in every jhana. And there's probably uh, 40 or more opportunities to do jhana. So it's an incredible amount of hours because you figure of course, every time you're not gonna have jhana arise. 
So it requires a lot of dedication and diligence to experience jhana. But as we finish each jhana, it's like our own consciousness frequency matches the jhana, like we, we hold that frequency. And then we then start preparing for the next jhana. And that's going to be a higher frequency that's a bit out, bit out of range for us yet. But in that jhana, we begin to get that frequency. And with enough time in the jhana, our consciousness does uh, emit that same frequency or we match the frequency. So jhana started in with the Buddha in Buddhism. And it's understood it was brought to China by Bodhidharma. And as Henry said, jhana became pronounced chana, chan, and then zen. And in my view, and also the view of some several very uh, well-known, well-respected Chan teachers uh, that I believe that the teachers wanting to minimize the striving of students began to pull back on the accomplishments or what jhana was. And then they began to minimize the instruction to try to just get, get people to sit and then uh, jhana can arise. I actually had jhana arise when I was a Zen student because I was following the breath in Shikantaza. In those days, they gave us elaborate instructions on the physical posture and nothing on the interior state. And so I ended up in one retreat, just staying with my breath in this area. And um, the jhana unfolded, which I recognize now. I told my teacher and he told me I was doing something wrong. So he wasn't aware of jhana at the time, wasn't well known. So that's really all I, all I have to present. I wanted to leave time for questions or uh, if Henry wanted to make any comments about his experience or the contrast with John and Zen. I mean, I, I, I find there to be a lot of parallels uh, between the practices because even in the koan practice, which I've done some koan practice, there's a kind of illumination that happens in the resolution of the koan. There's a kind of area that gets illuminated of the mind. And uh, you don't always know what's going to be illuminated or why it's going to be illuminated, but both jhana and the koan practice to me have those qualities. So I think there is a relationship to it. Anyway, Henry, anything you want to share or add? Yeah, thanks very much, Stephen. Lovely. Um, I Yes, I, I think um, um, one one point of resonance that that came up for me while while uh, under your guidance actually was you know this matter of wall gazing that sometimes in jhana uh practice they speak of wall gazing and um of course as you know many of you here will know bodhidharma was called the wall gazing brahmin and you know there's been a lot of speculation about what that meant and to hear that the term was applied in jhana practice as well um, is quite interesting because the 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 uh, from my my experience of, with jhana is I mean it's it's a, it's a, it's it seems to me in some ways it's it's probably I wonder whether shikantaza is really the practice that 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 grew out of the the sort of uh, jhana practice divested of its proper instructions, you know, and and because koan koan training is is very, um, it's so much about our our kind of uh, the inseparability of the world and us, you know. It's very very much a sort of you know practice of the world is the teacher, the things in the world are our teacher. So I feel, in a way, it's it's got uh, it's got that slightly different emphasis of finding that there is no possible separation of the of the absolute from you know just these words, uh, this you know this shirt, this anything, absolutely inseparable, you know, and no no possibility of dividing the absolute from any ordinary thing so whereas in jhana we're really going into a very very uh marvelous um 
um, kind of, I mean, I think probably in the end it will take us there in the sort of, in, in the further reaches of the ninth jhana. And so we'll start to really get, mm. um, but the, but, but the, but the, 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 the utter uh, joy and peace and, and freedom <clears throat> and, and, and oneness that we taste in, in each of the jhanas is quite, is quite marvelous. And it's, I, I felt it's very, it's a very wonderful thing that such sort of care and attention to really specific sort of details of meditative experience and how how the you know the particular factors of each jhana are are, are parsed out and are known and i found it quite wonderful and fascinating and i think it's something that you know we don't see in the zen tradition really that kind of uh, particular care of of the of different flavors of profound well-being that 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 we can find in meditation um i mean we it's 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 it, we've of course found it in other most marvelous ways as well in zen but the, but the very the, the very sort of uh, particular detailed care of tuning into these particular states i found it absolutely fascinating um so yeah what would anybody like to uh, ask stephen any anything about this yeah. or, or stephen do you, do you want to say something i just wanted to add one thing I, uh, as henry is alluding to there there are uh, nine jhanas there are four considered form jhanas the experiences in the body there are four formless jhanas that are uh, talked about as realms, and each of these is a quality of the absolute. So it's infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite no thingness or nothingness, and the base of neither perception nor non perception, which simply means non conceptual, completely non conceptual. And the ninth jhana is a direct experience, a direct absorption into the absolute. So I, I very much appreciate your comment on the koans. I hadn't gone that far into it, but I think there's a lot of parallels as you're explaining that. I think it's a relationship with the absolute and also where in effect our mind is being purified, becoming more and more pure so that we can eventually match the absolute. And that's when we can enter into it and abide uh, in the absolute as the absolute. So please uh, raise a hand um, if, if you'd like, and we can unmute you. Please. Michael. Okay, let's get Michael unmuted. Um, yeah. Um, Michael can't, is not yet unmuted. There we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, very pleased to meet you, Stephen. Um, you too. I was wondering if you could clarify just one uh, point, uh, uh, but it may be all important. Uh, you mentioned uh, concentration on an object. And uh, at one point, I think you identified this with the breath, but I was wondering if there is something else. Some other object? Some, something other than the breath is the object of your concentration, your focus. Initially, the, the first round of jhanas is done with the breath. It's anapanasati. And th there's a second round. Once one completes the first through eighth jhanas, then one develops, excuse me, what first one through four, then one completes trips through the first four jhanas with what are called casinas, which are mind-made colored objects. They're not all color. There's also uh, light and space, uh, as well as things like earth and then the four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind. And so so that so each of those is getting purified in in our mind. So we're getting, you know, again, experience after experience in the jhana where that purification happens. Thank you. Thanks. Scott?
Thank, thank you. Um, wonderful talk. Um, could we, uh, is there any way to, to differentiate uh, between Kinsho and Jana? Well, the way I, I would differentiate it is that Jhana doesn't necessarily result in one recognizing one's true nature. Uh, jhana will, like first jhana, one will get a mastery over experience in the jhana, and again, that vibrational attunement. But somewhere along the line, usually the ninth jhana is where there would be a possibility, in my mind, of it having a parallel type of experience. And I'd also ask Henry to comment if he would. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. I, I'd say the same. I think you could you could certainly, uh, at least uh, to the shallow level I've done it, do all eight jhanas without any taste of Kensha. And but it's but on the other hand, it's quite interesting to consider the qualities that that the fifth, sixth, and seventh jhana are about. You know, the infinite spaciousness, infinite sort of really oneness of mind, a, a instrument of consciousness, one great consciousness, and, and nothing at all. And of course, those are dimensions uh, that we might taste in Kensho. But the, I think the difference is um, to be absolutely, uh, totally see through any trace of self and know that this is our true nature in a forceful, uh, sort of overwhelmingly irrefutable way. You know, it's the power of Kensho that, you know, that we, we just know that we've seen the real nature of ourself and the world. You know, that's, that's a, that is a, a different matter, but I, I suspect, a, as Stephen was saying, possibly ninth January is where the, the territory might overlap. I think it's, it's quite I, right. I, I think you're right. It could happen at any at any point, but it's it, traditionally that's not an outcome people experience. The only time they would potentially do that, I, I have a couple of folks who, by accessing the, the ninth jhana, which is direct absorption into the absolute, that resulted in like a Kensho experience where they saw themselves as that. They knew that they were nothing but that, and then they knew the whole world and everything was nothing but that. Thanks, Scott. Deborah? Okay, am I unmuted now? You are. Okay. Well, hello, and nice to meet you. you and you have a nice uh, Zen circle above your head there. I do. <laughs> nice Enzo. And um, over the years, I've uh, become acquainted in various ways with uh, the word jhana. And um, <laughs> most recently, I just read a, uh, an article by Ken Brasington about how to access jhana. And in this article, he says, if you sit down thinking, I'm going to access jhana, you never will. It's one of those things like, you know, if I focus, this is what, what I would like to have happen. It, it definitely won't. Could you please comment on that? Sure. Yeah, yeah the, I think that's true in all of Buddhism, that if we are conceptually overly identified with the result, it's going to interfere with our, our developing to that result because we're, we're setting it up as this is what I want to get. So I want to get that rather than this, this naturally unfolds. And I think in my experience, both with koans and with jhana practice, one of the big components is surrender. We have to let go and realize we're not in control. Something else is managing all this, and that's the absolute. So we show up, we return to the breath with jhana practice again and again and again. I used to tell people on the two month retreat I did with my teacher, I returned to the breath a million times. And I had somebody come into me once in an interview, and it was an engineer, and they had done the math, and they said, I couldn't have done it a million times in two months. So I had to tell them, I'm 
was speaking, you know, in that broad way that we do. I wasn't intending that to be an accurate representation, but it feels like a million times. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. Uh, one other question, if you would permit me. Um, often um, I sit with uh, what's called the nada sound. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. you were talking about the laser focus, that mm -hmm. and and you mentioned something like being attuned, mm -hmm. and it, it it does the nada sound and that attunement are they the same or quite different? Or the, the, the nada is seen as a sign of concentration. Not everybody gets it, and some people do. So if you get it, that means you're concentrated. Um, we could make some parallels but between that and what I'm talking about, the felt sense frequency of the jhana. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just as possible to talk about it like a, a frequency, like a radio frequency. It's the, there is a sense of kind of a, um, some kind of a, humming but again it's it's like a felt experience it isn't necessarily heard but you can feel the vibration like your your awareness and the awareness of the jhana or the jhana are merged so you're vibrating at that at that rate or not quite at first it takes time to get that up there and and all these things like in the koan practice it's going to highlight whatever is incongruent in our sense of self or in our behavior so we have to do work along the way of modifying and getting our life to be more wholesome, what we focus on in Theravada Buddhism called sila, which is wholesomeness or wholesome behavior. So that's an important aspect too, is, is trying to manage that and see what we need to let go of. A lot of letting go is of who we are. That's really one of the big give ups, which is a great blessing. Thank you so much. Thanks. Marianne? Can't quite hear you. Oh, there you are. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> Hi, Stephen. Thank you so Hi. much for your talk. You're welcome. Um, you mentioned that ultimately this practice is 24-7. Yep. And I what I mean by that is, is if one has the ability, it's very helpful to fall asleep with your awareness in the Anapana region. I, I did that and I found I was waking up at night and I was still here. So that really helped. Some people can't do it, it keeps them awake, but, but you wanna stay with it in your waking hours every moment if possible. Yeah, I was curious a little bit more about any practices of the night or experiences of the night, how this practice might affect one's dreams or dream yoga oh, yeah. or anything like that yeah on on retreat typically when i teach this practice it's at least a two-week retreat up to a month and people within a few days are having very elaborate dreams very colorful uh and i asked my teacher about this and he said that we're actually purging the karma from the storehouse consciousness so and and what's interesting is, of course, the view of traditional Buddhism is that we all are subject to rebirth. So we've had many lifetimes, not me, but some, you know, this the consciousness has been moving from lifetime to lifetime. And so some of what we're burning off is karma from past lifetimes. So people can have memories that are very vivid of things they never did, but they have a kind of it feels like I was there. I was doing it. I was. You know, I was a warrior in some battle, killing people or something that is clearly outside my modern experience. Thank you. Yes. And then is there perhaps an increase in lucid dreaming with all of this, be, being aware that you're dreaming? There, there could be. It's, it's not a typical uh, step people take, but I think it would be possible to do and would be extremely, as I say, very vivid if one could do it. Well, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Abby. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. I have a very simple question. I'm trying to coordinate um, this new vocabulary with some not quite as new vocabulary. So are the jhanas um cat categorizations of samadhi i'm trying to relate the terms 
Jhana is is sometimes referred to as samadhi. I I don't use that term just because any of these terms that are used too broadly, I try to stay away from because they just lack precision. But I think if we think about samadhi as being a, a unified consciousness, then absolutely jhana practice is a samadhi practice. But it it's more subtle what you're saying in in um discerning different states of samadhi. Well, I'm not sure. I don't know if I'd say different states of samadhi. I'd say the samadhi is the same, but the samadhi is merging with a different quality with each progressive jhana. You're, again, purifying the mind more and more with each jhana to the point that with uh, like the base of neither perception or non-perception, the non-conceptual, you're totally functioning out of energetic impulse. You're not, you're having no thoughts at all. You're you know, so you can't do this and be in the world. You have to be in retreat setting because it, it's that delicate of an experience. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're welcome. Speech, Christian. Hi, Stephen. Thank Hi. you your talk um i was wondering i i know there's um uh with um chula dasa uh mm -hmm. Ada, yeah uh, um with his uh practices um there was kind of emerging an ability to bring um insight practice into to jhana practice and, and i was wondering in the, the tradition of um Pak, Sayada, whether whether that um, there was where there was that kind of bringing those those practices together as well. No, our our view would be that one could do that, but you'd be doing it in access concentration, because to do it, to do investigation, the insight investigation, you're going to be using a certain amount of thought to do that, and in jhana, there's in our tradition, there's no thought, so that that would be something. That would happen in access. And as far as I know, um, Chuladasa or Kuladasa, I'm not. I'm not aware that he's uh, a was a lineage teacher from any of the jhana traditions. I think he was more self-taught. But I, I don't know a lot about him. I just know when I asked around with other jhana teachers, no one knew what lineage he was from. Yeah. Thank you. And and can I just uh, put one add-on question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, with is is there? Well, I, I think you answered it. it so it's it's not possible to to enter into jhana using um, uh, mental mental uh, objects. No, it is because the the casinas that are the second go second pass to the first through fourth jhana and then fifth through eighth jhana are mind created. Uh, objects, their discs. So for example, one of them is earth. We go out and we find a place with no rocks and draw a circle in the dirt. And we look at it until we can close our eyes and hold it in our mind's eye as a mental object that becomes the meditative object. And that we get so concentrated that that leads to absorption into the earth quality. So we're perfectly merged with whatever the essence of earth is and, and so that becomes a a, a visual um in, in the visual realm mm -hmm. right of, of thought is is it also possible to enter into a jhana with with the auditory component of thought i'm not aware of that being a um, a practice i know it's true in other practices um, i know in the korean song tradition they have that as a practice and also when I did Tibetan Buddhist Rigpa practice, I used the sound as my object. My they do samatha with support, without support, and then Rigpa. So with the samatha with support, that was my object. Thank you. You're welcome.
Stephen, may I, I'm just curious, actually, when you say that, uh, just about your, your the practice, you did, the Rigpa practice, but Samatha with object, with support, what was, when you say it was a sound, I mean, was it something like a mantra? No, I, I simply use the, the uh, hearing, oh. my, my function of hearing any sound. I was, I was focused in the ear and the sound hitting that spot in my ear. So I wasn't discriminating for any particular sound, but all sound. And so very discreet objects. So it required a lot of concentration. And then once the concentration there, you drop the, the following the sound and stay with the concentrated state as your object. And then the mind turning, either you turn, this awareness turns to view the awareness that's holding your awareness or there's the backward step, which is more what I teach and I teach Rigpa, is there's a backward step one can do where the, the apparent self-awareness and the universal awareness, we see them, they're, they're actually one, there's no division, but we conceptually hold ours as separate. So really the concept drops and we're in that unified field of, of uh, clarity and um, I guess it's concentration. Thank you. Very interesting. It's fascinating, isn't it? How <laughs> um, there are, you know, among all these traditions, there are, there are some very uh, uh, sp specific sort of instructions, and in 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 some and 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 in Zen, it's rather it's rather loose. You know, sit down, <laughs> pick up a koan, see what happens. <laughs> well, I, I used to tell people that my my Zen training, I felt like I was a, I was a hot air balloon pilot. I could definitely get in the air, but I never knew where I was going to go or where I was going to land. <laughs> and and with the this practice, I mean, you know this, there's so much precision and there's so, you know, it's like being in a, a fighter jet where you have all these dials and switches and I know how to use them all. So I can, you know, a student will have this issue. OK, try that, you know, adjust that dial. And and it really is very precise. It works interestingly and and i think you found this too what i find so fascinating is that the jhana practice even though it's thousands of years old it still absolutely pertains and relates to our consciousness and we benefit our consciousness benefits from the practice even today yeah yeah i, I quite agree and there's no doubt that somehow these uh these whatever they are states uh they're absolutely viable and they're alive here and now and right and you know we we can we can just learn to to tune into to be absorbed by them really right be absorbed by them and it's a very wonderful thing to get absorbed in that kind of way it really mm. is uh, I, I wish we all have a taste of that sometime you know maybe you'll come back and teach us how to do it <laughs> sure anytime you like <laughs> Well, thank you all for inviting me. I've had a really fun time here and really enjoyed our practice time together. So thank you all very much. Stephen, thank you so much. Very, real blessing for us. Thank you. Thank Great. you, everybody, for being here tonight.